Welcome to another interesting episode of Open Book On Location. I'm Katie Poole, the board chair of the Literary Alliance and a passionate reader like you. Now in our 12th year, our all-volunteer nonprofit provides these fabulous conversations with your favorite authors. At our website, PasadenaLiteraryAlliance.org, you can find more author interviews, make donations to the Alliance to allow us to provide grants for literary initiatives, and participate, send questions for the authors, or contribute author suggestions at the Contact Us tab. See you soon at Open Book On Location. Okay. Well, I'm here today with two good friends, um, authors uh, with some overlapping interests. Uh, the first today is Daniel Stashauer. Uh, Dan is the author of a num I've lost count of how many books, winner of three Edgars um, and other depressing achievements, uh, depressing to me anyway. Uh, and our other guest uh, will be Heather Ann Thompson, um, who doesn't have any Edgars, but she did win the Pulitzer for, uh, for, for her wonderful book on Attica, which we'll talk about in a bit. So um, you can probably guess from the pairing here that I want to talk really mostly about nonfiction writing and sort of how you got there and all that. You started, Dan, as a writer of fiction and then somewhere went wrong. What what happened? It's true. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how I strayed from the path of fiction, but I started out writing mystery novels. I always loved mystery novels, and, I'm, and I still do. Uh, and, but at some point, I made a pivot, and that pivot, as with so many other things in my life, had to do with Arthur Conan Doyle. I loved uh, this guy, Sherlock Holmes, growing up. I, I think you've heard of him, Les. Yes. And uh, uh, the stories were so much a big part of my life. I did all kinds of reading around the stories. I read the writings about the writings, and I also read a lot about Conan Doyle, and I read Conan Doyle's other books, his non-Sherlock Holmes books. And eventually that led me to a place where I had questions about Conan Doyle's life that I wasn't able to answer by reading other biographies about Conan Doyle. Um, and without really intending it, I started writing one myself. How was it different? I mean, uh, considerably different, I'm sure, but well, uh, was it like reinventing yourself as a writer, do you think? I mean, did you feel like you had to sort of throw away some ideas and techniques? You know, certainly there are some things you can't do. There are some things you can do as a fiction writer that you can't do as a nonfiction writer. But I have found, and I, and I suspect Heather is, will feel the same way, that a lot of the techniques of fiction turned out to be very, very useful when I started writing nonfiction. Particul that makes it sound, I suppose, like uh, I, I'm, I'm saying that we could make it up, that you can just uh, uh, make up a line of dialogue or whatever. And I, that, that's far from it. But I did find that a lot of the techniques, a lot of the structure, a lot of the, um, I don't want to say um, fabric fabrications, but the dramatic elements, the sense of setting a scene, moving things forward, uh, that work so well in fiction also apply to nonfiction if you can find them. And of course the challenge is when you are approaching a nonfiction story to find those beats of the story that have that same kind of rhythm that carry you along as a storyteller. So the first book, Teller of Tales, um, really dove into which one you, I think the first of your Edgars, um, uh, was different from some of the previous biographies uh, of Conan Doyle, of which there were probably already a half a dozen by that point. In that, um, from my perspective, 
you focus deeply on the spiritualist side of Conan Doyle's life and, and the part that, frankly, to a lot of us has been sort of a mystery and difficult to understand. Um, did you just sort of happen on that or is that where you set it out to go? That is absolutely where I set out to go. You know, I, I, I can remember specifically uh, when I started on that, on that road. Uh, I was, uh, I did a junior year abroad at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England, and I was well along in my Baker Street fever uh, by that time. And there was a, this book alley in Brighton uh, 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 called The Lanes, where there were a lot of uh, wonderful bookstores. And I went through and I bought everything by Conan Doyle that I could afford. You know, the, the early editions of Sherlock Holmes were out of my price range. But I could pick up things like this, The Coming of the Fairies. Uh, I didn't know much about it when I, when I bought it. I didn't know much about uh, the history of spiritualism. I didn't know much about um, the, other, the other spiritualism books that Conan Doyle had written when I bought them. But there they were, they had Conan Doyle's name on the spine and I could afford them, I could afford two or three pounds to pick them up. But they did lead me to this question that I was puzzling over for, for quite a while, which was a question a lot of us have asked ourselves, how did Conan Doyle, who created the ultimate rationalist in Sherlock Holmes, find his way to a belief in spiritualism, the belief that the living can communicate beyond the veil with the dead. And it seemed to me as I read other biographies on the subject that that was where some, certainly not all of the biographers chose to wrap things up. They backed away. Uh, John Dixon Carr as much as said that there's no explaining it. It's a bigger question than, than us. There was some element of Conan Doyle that escapes analysis. And maybe that's true. But Conan Doyle spent the last 14 years of his life as the world's foremost proponent of spiritualism. And it felt to me anyway, as if it was difficult to understand the man's life without understanding where he ended up, where his path took him. And that's what I was trying to do. It's an interesting topic for right now, of course, as well. Because yeah, sure is. Conan Doyle, you know, the, the whole rise of the spiritualist movement was in part fueled by uh, the Great War. And the huge, and and then the 1917 influenza flu, which killed so many people, um, and families were desperate to continue or have some connection to their to their lost ones. Um, and Conan Doyle was himself, I think, motivated by that. Don't don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Conan Doyle's personal losses uh, in the war and in the pandemic were terrible, including his son Kingsley, as you, as you well know. But it's uh, often felt that it was the death of Kingsley that brought him to spiritualism. Certainly that served to perhaps deepen his belief and bring him into, out into a public forum with spiritualism. But he was already a committed spiritualist when that happened. But he felt a sense of duty, it seems to me, to share the consolation that he had found through spiritualism with everyone in the country suffering as they were. And this wasn't some product of his dotage. I mean, he'd, he'd been a seeker since his school days when he basically, I think, decided that he wasn't, he didn't buy the Catholic doctrine. Uh, he was a lapsed Jesuit scholar and he was a seeker very early on in his, in his days in the 18, 70s, I guess, um, as spiritualism and other things were percolating in the country. Um, well, from there, you pivoted in a totally different direction um, from Conan Doyle, and, and you've taken on such fascinating topics. I mean, between Lincoln and Poe and, and uh, Philo T. Farnsworth, one of my favorites, how do you choose? You know, uh, it took me some time to realize what the answer to that was. Uh, and it seems to be that with uh, each topic that I've come, that I've made my way towards, it tends to start with a question that I can't answer. You mentioned 
Philo T. Farnsworth, The Boy Inventor of Television, which was the book I wrote after Teller of Tales. Which it's a little off brand for me because it doesn't involve a, a murder story, a true crime story. But I realized one day um, that I didn't know the name of the inventor of television. And you know, I think of myself as a reasonably intelligent guy. I, I know who invented the light bulb. I know who invented the cotton gin. But television, which let's face it, is a, takes a pretty big role in our, in our daily lives and in shaping our culture. I didn't know the story of how it came to be invented. And it seemed to me that there must be a pretty fascinating story behind it. And indeed there was. It's, it's a really interesting story and also interesting that the, uh, that the idea for what became television, the electronic scanning of television came to him as a 14 year old boy. And he somehow not only managed to put it together but find the, the backing to make it a reality. It's, a, it's, it's just an incredible story. And I had always been interested in it because as I think I've discussed with you, Les, uh, I have a, a distant relation of mine was Hugo Gernsback, uh, a figure in oh, the yes. science fiction world. He was my grandmother's cousin. And she used to speak about him with, uh, with uh, affection, but also a certain amount of trepidation, all the crazy science fiction uh, ideas yes. that, he would, that he would expound upon. And he said to her once, and she never forgot it, when the phone rang, Hildegard, fix your hair. In the future, they'll be able to see you over the, tele <laughs> the telephone. <laughs> oh, how stupid. <laughs> what a crazy idea. What a crazy idea. <laughs> But uh, Gernsback wound up having an early television magazine and being part of this campaign to get viewers to build their own television sets with model kits so that they could receive signals that he himself would be beaming out from New York. There was a lot of that kind of home science uh, gears and inventions thing going on uh, in the story. Great stuff. So was there an element of mystery to the story that, that drew you in? That... It, only in the sense that there was this wonderful Pulp Fiction magazine th thread uh, going, going throughout it. You know, I love those old, the, the magazines, the amazing stories, the thrilling adventure stories right. kind of uh, aspect of it. And there was this, this sense, and certainly a lot of the early uh, television dramas made the transition from radio. There was a lot of Sherlock Holmes and other uh, um, hard-boiled detectives as a feature of early television. But the feature of it that really um, just gripped me was this idea that uh, why don't we know about this 14-year-old boy who invented television? How could this have sort of languished, uh, at least as far as I knew, for, for so long and been relatively unknown? So I don't want to spend a lot of time on each of the books. I mean, I will mention the next one you don't, you Undaunted, you took up a mystery that uh, no one could solve for a hundred years, uh, uh, the mystery of Marie Roger or Mary Rogers or however we'd like to refer to her. Uh, and, and then on to Lincoln and uh, uh, the uh, attempted assassination of Lincoln. But so I, I come back to the question I asked at the front. How do you pick these? I mean, what, you know, is it, do you find the story first do you sort of sit out looking, to, are there criteria in your mind of what's going to grab you? After all, I mean, you must spend, what, two or three years on a book? Um, Easily, and, and sometimes as long as that finding the idea, because uh, the, the lucky thing with Conan Doyle is you had a fascinating figure at the center of it, and you also had the additional appeal of being able to talk so much about Sherlock Holmes. With the Cigar Girl book, Edgar Allan Poe, that's a fascinating character. So being able to write about him, about his life and about his struggles uh, was fantastic. And what a story. And, and it, it couldn't be more different from the story of Conan Doyle in so many ways. But there was also uh, this question lingering in my mind. You know, we all love Murders in the Rue Morgue. We all love The Purloined Letter. We all love... Uh, the Gold Bug, so, so many co co uh, Edgar Allan Poe stories. Cask of Amontillado is my, is my personal favorite. Me too. 
Nobody loves the mystery of Marie Roget. Nobody loves it. It's like the chipped teacup that gets included in the set because you don't want to throw it out. It makes a set, but because it's about Dupin, Poe's detective. But wow, it goes on and on about extracts from newspapers and stomach gases and firing a cannon over the water to try to get the corpse to float up. It's a difficult story. Uh, to to make your way through without context. And it turns out there was this terrific context. If I were to write a story now in which uh, there's a glove that does not fit and there's a, a freeway chase with a white Bronco, you would know immediately what I'm talking about. But a hundred years from now, they wouldn't. It would have become detached from its context. And the same thing happened with the mystery of Marie Roget. Poe was writing about a story that was incredibly current at the time Headlines. Headlines. and his readers would have known that there had been this girl mary rogers and she'd been murdered and she worked in a cigar store and she turned up dead floating in the in the hudson and they would have recognized that he was trying to solve this with his fictional detective dupin but now reading it now and even as long as 50 years ago it had become separated from its original meaning and and what i hope to do what interested me about it was to sort of put it back in its setting and see if it was could be better understood that way. Well, let's talk for a, a minute about uh, a topic dear to both of our hearts, I think, which is research. Um, and uh, friend, a friend of mine who writes uh, uh, both fiction and nonfiction described what he called research rapture, uh, you know, sort of where you're so lost in the wonderfulness of the research you can't quite sort of get back to the writing. Uh, tell us some about your techniques and, and the lessons you've learned uh, and the skills that you had to hone. I'd love to tell you that I've learned lessons that I can pass along, but I feel as if I'm learning it uh, fresh each time. And I'll be interested to, to talk to Heather about that uh, very much so, because it's, it's very much a problem for me that I could spend the rest of my life researching each of my books even after it's done i'm never done and you know this with conan doyle absolutely, absolutely. teller of tales came out 20 years ago i'm still researching that book now that sounds glib and and uh self-serving i suppose but it's true stuff comes up all the time and the fact of, the, of it is that when you write a book certain things come up because people say well you wrote this book or you might be interested in this letter I found in the attic. You might be interested sure. in, in, in uh, this, this. I can't tell you how many uh, uh, people wrote to me after the Farnsworth book came out saying, you know what, my, my uncle also invented television and I bet you would be interested <laughs> in writing a book about him. Uh, that kind of thing happens. But I always feel that if you're doing it right, that if you found a really good subject, it's very hard to know when to stop researching, but the day comes eventually where you have to start writing some of it down. Certainly deadlines play, play a, a compelling role and you have to, you have to get it working. But I always, it's, it becomes useful for me not to think of it not as, okay, the research stops. I start to think, well, I'm going to start writing and that will guide and focus the research that I still have to do. And I think that's reasonable but I have to play little tricks with myself to, to get myself to stop uh, going to the library, to stop researching, because that, that is the part that I enjoy. And then you find something new and it's like, oh, I'd better pause and do this and all that. But no, I know exactly what you're talking about with the, the unending part of the research. I mean, my Sherlock Holmes books are now about the same time as yours. They're, they're 2004 and five. And I still, you know, these things here, these are mostly Sherlock Holmes books. I don't, have, the IRS isn't listening to this conversation, so uh, I don't think. Uh, but and 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 Frankenstein and Lovecraft and Dracula, I haven't stopped collecting and gathering data, and maybe there'll be a new edition someday. But uh, there's always knows? another book to read. There's always another article. Yes. Uh, and and in your case, the the amount of research that must go into a single annotation, the amount of, of material you have to get through sometimes just for a couple of lines. I feel that all the time. I mean, I uh, uh, you, you're, you're wa wandering around in a used bookstore. 
just going through the shelves and things leap out at you as if, the, as if they're lighting up on the shelves. Oh, that might yes. have that and that might have, have that. But I love it. I mean, that is, that's why we do it, I think. I, I agree. Um, so let's talk for a minute, if you, if you will, about the new project. Well, I am weirdly, uh, I'm weirdly superstitious about talking about a work in progress. I hope to have something out late next year, which will fit neatly on a shelf with uh, Cigar Girl and Hour of Peril, um, my, my most, most recent books. But uh, I, if I start talking about it here, my wife will burst through the door and wrestle me to the ground. Because once I start, it goes on for 23 hours. And uh, I, uh, my challenge is to, uh, to boil it down to elevator length. Okay, well, we will wait with bated breath to find out uh, what that might be, but I assume it will be of great interest to all of us, uh, if it's anything like your existing books. So, uh, Dan, to say. we're gonna come back, um, but I, I think this is a good time for us to break and for me to talk to Heather for a bit, and uh, then we'll rejoin you. So Heather Ann Thompson, professor turned writer, I guess, is the way I would describe it. Is that how you see yourself? Well, I, I, I think so. I'd say professor and writer turned author, which is sort of the difference. You know, I'm a historian, so I write uh, all the time. I've always been a writer, but I think there's a big difference between writing for the academy and being an author, which is trying to write for uh, the world for everyone else. And um, I really enjoyed actually hearing Dan talk about making the transition from fiction writing to nonfiction, because of course my secret dream is to one day learn how to write fiction. I feel like the nonfiction part is, uh, you know, this is what we do as scholars. And so for me, it's always the pushing myself to become more like a, a, a writer of nonfiction, including all of, you know, the descriptive kind of prose that that entails and so forth. So finally an author maybe, but uh, always a writer. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it, it, it's, we all have to live with as, as nonfiction writers. Um, we live with, well, as my wife puts it always, when are you gonna write a real book? Um, and meaning, fiction. And I keep saying to her, why would I ever want to do that? You know, it's, there are many, many more fiction writers than there are nonfiction writers. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult market to sort of rise above the crowd. And um, I'm very happy in this little tiny niche. And your niche is not so tiny. I mean, you took on major social issues um, with blood on the water. Um, and I want to get into that a little bit and sort of how you got into that topic. And your next book promises to be more of the same. We'll come back to the next book uh, in a few minutes, but let's, let's start with talking about Blood on the Water, which is an amazing, incredible, shattering book. Um, it came out of historical research first. I mean, the research came first, and then, oh, then you said, let's do a book. Well, you know, we always write books as historians. That's part of the deal. We, we, that's how we get employed. That's how we uh, get tenure, get promoted. But what we don't often do is have a book that we write that we imagine from the beginning to be written for non-academic audiences. And so from the beginning, when I took on that book, I knew I wanted it to be uh, you know, I, I, I always thought to myself, you know, read by my grandparents, you know, read by my cousins, read by people who had nothing to do with my uh, students and, and my fellow historians. And, um, and so it was, it was really a journey to both kind of retrain myself or try to anyway as a, as a writer. Uh, but also the core of it remained research because that's what historians do and that's what we do I think really well. I mean there's no no stone unturned, no, no, uh, no episode of anything that I think we're feeling shy about uh, digging into. I think that's what we're trained to do but it's translating that on the page that's the challenge. Well and, and Blood in the Water, I mean this is now about ancient history. I mean, we're talking about events that took place 40 years ago. Um, and yet, right, yes. Uh, some, and, and antecedents before that. And, and yet, this is not a 
dull, dry book of history. And mm -hmm. was that what you were, I mean, you, did you see this as much more than just an examination of a specific prison riot and sort of what happened and why? Did you always see the bigger implications of it? Well, you know, I, I, I was thinking about when you were at, talking to Dan about how he picks projects and I was trying to think about why, how do I pick projects and, and the truth is that I'm interested in the past, but I am always, I always have been interested in the past as it is relevant to the present and as it could inform the future. Uh, and so everything I've studied and written uh, about has, I think, immediate relevance or resonance with the present day. And in this case, uh, I chose the, the topic of this uh, uprising behind bars because at the time I really saw myself as a historian of civil rights and certainly of uh, urban history and African-American history. And that has a lot to do with where I came from. I grew up in the city of Detroit. And uh, anyway, that's a separate story. But when I, when I picked Attica, I didn't really think about the whole thing about it being in a prison. And because that book took so long to research over the course of doing the book, uh, I think the world woke up. I woke up to the crisis of mass incarceration. And so the book yes. became uh, really a, an opportunity for me, I hoped for my readers to kind of think about this pivot we took in 1970, really 71, where we began incarcerating everybody uh, at higher rates than any other country. And I thought that there was something about this episode that could shine light on that. And so it became very much about something today that we, we think is important, we think we need to understand. But I also knew that on its own terms, it was a pretty incredible story. I mean, this is a, an episode of, uh, you know, a civil rights episode where the state of New York uh, storms this prison and manages to kill all of these prisoners and guards and, you know, shoot 128 people, you know, six, seven times, and no one is held accountable. Uh, and in fact, the only ones ever uh, indicted were the prisoners. And so to me, it was like with Dan, it was sort of like, why? A mystery. You know, I wanted to find out. Uh, I wanted to know how there had, how this had gone so awry. And, you know, was there a cover up? Turns out there was. Um, but, but, you know, it was really about, always about the present at some level. Um, because I, you know, I, I don't, I wasn't just interested in the past for esoteric reasons. And the next book, which is called Bombs and Burning, did I get that it's right? It's called uh, Bullet and Burn, and it's a similar story to Attica. It's about the MOVE bombing in 1985 in Philadelphia, which is a similar clash between um, law enforcement and the Black community in Philadelphia. In this case, it all culminates after, it's a very involved story, but it all culminates with the Philadelphia Police Department dropping explosives on a row house and incinerating fully two city blocks of the city of Philadelphia. And it's one of those stories like Attica that we all kind of remember vaguely. Um, it has real resonance about policing and police killings, but but we didn't, we don't really know what happened and how did it happen? And again, like Attica, how does it happen? And yet no one is ever held accountable. Right. You're interested in how did we get here? How did we get to, as you, as you said, um, the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world, uh, more women in American prisons than any other country. Mm -hmm. um, more people, yeah. more uh, children, uh, more people, all people. Yes. Uh, and it's just, you know, our solution, unfortunately, our solution to poverty um, in, in uh, the neighborhoods of color, black and brown neighborhoods, is generally, let's arrest people. That'll solve the property problems. We'll just arrest them and put them in prisons. Um, and of course, right now, we're suffering with people coming out of prisons that uh, because of the, the pandemic. But um, well, it's interesting, you know, I, I actually think I'm probably, I, I think certainly the work that I do has radicalized me, I can say that, which is to say that when you do dig into the past, the more you learn and the more you kind of unpack how things happen and why things happen, um, you know, you do also become a social critic. And so I think that my work has taken me into some other directions. I, I still very much am passionate about writing and, I, and I'm, 
you know, thrilled to finally feel like now I know how to do that better than I ever did in terms of really writing in such a way that's engaging to people, even if it is traumatic, you know, in a way that, you know, we could talk all day about like the struggle that that was, you know, how does one write violence? How does one, how does one capture all points of view in such a way that makes the story compelling no matter who the reader and but at the end of the day i also really felt that there was an obligation after writing it to kind of speak publicly about prisons and to speak publicly about the crisis of policing and prisons and so forth and so in a funny way that book also took me into the realm much more of public policy and uh, and so it's, it's really been a, quite a journey i have to say well, let's talk a little about the research parts of this. Um, yeah. You know, Dan, and we'll get back into this with Dan a little bit, Dan's research is mostly in libraries uh, mm -hmm. because he's writing about the 19th century or he's writing about the early 20th century um, and there's nobody to interview, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, yours is more like journalism, I think. Is, is, do you think that's well, it's fair? Actually, it's very similar to what Dan does. So, you know, the truth is historians are trained to do exactly what Dan mentioned. We go into the, we go into archives and we ask for box 30 and, you know, folder 20, and we reconstruct the past based on the documentary evidence, even if that past is 1971. You know, I mean, the, the scores of papers that I have in my office from Attica, you know, go from one side of the room to the next. But the thing about a lot of the stories that I write is that it's not that there's no paper trail. It's not that there's no uh, evidence. It's that the stories I'm writing about are still very raw. And in the case of Attica, uh, there's no statute of limitations on murder. So right. the state was not willing to have me see its archives. And in the case of MOVE, I'm finding block after block with my freedom of information requests. And so I had to think about how do I do this a different way. It was one of the reasons the book took so long. It was this journey of how do I find essentially the, the copy of what this, what's supposed to be in the state archives or what's in the state archives or the original. And it took me into people's basements and all around the world and talking to them and looking at lawyers and talking to judges. I mean, I, you know, and ultimately, and this is a little scary for me as a researcher, I was not able to really tell the nitty gritty of that story until I happened, happened upon a whole cache of records that they didn't even know were, were there. And so it was a bit of a, <laughs> a, a complete accident that I was able to, for example, name who the shooters were after 35 years. But the method wow. is the same as what, as what Dan mentioned. It's just that some of these stories they don't want you to look at the documents. And it sounds a bit, you know, a little cloak and dagger, but but it actually is. But you do have some live bodies that you can talk to about things. You know, well, if they'll talk to you. And, and, will, I, yes. and I was, I, I was actually very lucky. I had, I got to talk to both the guard survivors and a lot of the guard survivors and prisoner survivors and judges and lawyers. But at the end of the day, you know, to me, I like to see the documentary evidence. You know, memory has a tricky way of, uh, you know, changing the past in people's own minds. And so it's always about really still about the research base that, that Dan was talking about. Well, let me, let me pivot a little bit to History Studio because I want to talk about that. Um, sure. So you're involved in a, a company that is essentially, I think of it as helping creators get to the truth of the stories that they're telling. Uh, working with movie studios, uh, working with uh, other people who are trying to do mostly fictionalized versions mm -hmm. of stories and doing uh, fact checking, editing, consulting, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get there? I mean, wh why? Why that pursuit? That, that seems, uh, you know, it's it's, it's, one, it's, of a, it's a, yeah. one of the ten hats. <laughs> It's been a long couple of years. Uh, no, I, I thank you for asking about that. Well, essentially what happened is that after I wrote Attica, the uh, Attica book was optioned for a film and it just kind of it immersed me very quickly into the world of taking the, the books that we do into a different kind of storytelling medium, 
Britain, which is, uh, in this case, uh, the, the writing of a screenplay that came out of it and the kind of imagining what that would be uh, one day on, a, on the silver screen. And, and I, I began doing more work thinking about helping people with their screenplays, their scripts, you know, kind of vetting them for accuracy, vetting them really oftentimes for cultural sensitivity, that is to say, making sure that all the characters are you know, equally developed, making sure that the storyline doesn't, you know, unwittingly stereotype anyone or, or, or such. And, and I discovered other really amazing scholars that were doing the same thing. Uh, my partner, for example, um, Erica uh, Armstrong Dunbar is, she's a National Book Award finalist, author, a historian like myself, and she's doing these kinds of projects. And so we merged forces and we created History Studio to really be, I think, uh, we are the only female Black-owned company in the entire industry that is, is there to really vet these projects and help develop these projects with an eye towards accuracy yes but also just authenticity like it's sort of the, the thing about the the past and all the research we do is you don't need to make up a lot of stuff because in fact the right. stories are already so rich let's just bring them to life right and it's a challenge i mean i've i've done some consulting on um sherlock holmes films primarily mm -hmm. but some other mm -hmm. projects as well and it's always a balance as i'm sure you've discovered between wanting authenticity, wanting accuracy, but at the same time, understanding it's not my project. It, right. It's a creator's yeah. project. You know, I, we want them to be true to their own vision. Um, and I, I still remember when I first uh, uh, got involved with the Sherlock Holmes films, the Robert Downey films, I know the producer was scared that I was <laughs> gonna basically say, this is awful, you can't do this, you have to do that. Right. And I, you know, I tried to very quickly assure him, look, you know, we're gonna do. We're gonna make the movie you want to make. If I can right. help make it a little better, great. Well, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we're in, we're there to augment the incredible talent that is already there. It is certainly not to say, well, it, it you know, there's no room here for dramatization or your vision doesn't make sense. It's actually to say, what is your vision and how can we help you make that more authentic, or how can we have that really ring true with all the audiences that will come to see it? And let's you know, let's think about broadly who those audiences might be, and let's think broadly about you know, what characters are hidden in there that, that we could develop with you, you know, that we could help kind of enrich. So it's actually, for me, it's also been really good because again, as I'm trying to make this transition from writer and scholar and, and researcher to author and storyteller in a much more capacious way, I love thinking about like, how would, how would one visualize that? How would one put that in a different, you know, how, what, what's the core of this person I'm trying to describe? What is the core of this event? Uh, and, and it sort of, it, it really helps with the writing. It, it is it's very, you know, synergetic in terms of the whole experience is pretty amazing. Well, let's bring Dan back to the conversation and, yeah. and, the, and I mean, and, and Dan can talk about the same thing. I mean, that's what he was starting to talk about before, I think, yeah. was yeah. finding the, not the fiction in the reality, but the, the story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fascinated by, by what you're saying, Heather, because that is so much of what, of, of what the challenge is, is to find the story. Mm -hmm. And I was also so interested in what you were saying about, about looking at the documentary sources versus talking to people uh, mm -hmm. and, and trying to get a sense of what, uh, of what the truth is, trying to untangle some, you can, as you well know, two people can be in the same room and remember it differently. And it's very, very hard. I imagine with the move story, particularly, you're finding all these different accounts and you have to somehow chart a, a path that makes sense and is the most likely to have been true. Well, and I think exactly. And, and often, you know, you don't always know. And so my goal in, in the writing is to, the way I've described it is, you know, in Attica, one minute you're in D yard and you're with the prisoners, but then the next minute you're in Rockefeller's office and, and the next minute, you know, trying to kind of shift the gaze of the reader so that, because if I do, if I, if I get it right to me, it is getting the reader to empathize with people they had never imagined empathizing with. And, and then all of a sudden wondering why and questioning their own 
feelings and their own motivations and the kind of unsettledness of, of reading uh, is, I, I think that's real life and to be able to capture that. But where I have learned so much and I'm, I confess you're still learning, you say you're still learning about research, I'm still learning about the the way you narrate that. I have a funny story, which is when I did my first book proposal for the Attica book. I mean, I'd written other things, very historical, you know, very much more, um, you know, uh, much more academic. And she said, well, this is a great story. She said, but can you tell me something about, you know, one of the characters whose who's actual, his name was Frank Smith, but he went by the name Big Black. And she said, can you tell me something about him? And I just looked at her blankly and I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, what does he sound like? You know, what does he look like? And I just said, well, I don't know. Because for me, it's like, I don't have a footnote on that. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to dare to say what he looks like. And she looked at me, just, she says, have you seen a picture of him? Have you heard him speak on, you know, a video? It's like, yes, then tell me. <laughs> because I'm so <laughs> locked in the footnotes, but I think for fiction the writers, fact. they feel like, can I really say that? Did it really happen? You know, the research piece of it. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, you, you're, you're, you're used to focusing on the facts, not, right. the, uh, <laughs> not the impressions, the sensations, wow. I suspect. And then metaphors, you know, you know the, the way you can conjure up a description rather than just say, you know, the, the, the adjectives. It was terrible. It was awful. It was brutal. It was, you know, but no, but you got to feel that it was terrible. And that's, it's been a journey. I, I love it, but it's been a real journey. So either of you or both of you, when, when you start, do you know where you're going to end up? Do you, do you sort of have a, a point? I mean, I, I, some didactic message that you think the story is going to deliver and, and then you are moving down that path or do they evolve as the story goes or how does it work? I've never done this. So I just write foot notes. <laughs> I don't know, Dan, what about you? Definitely. I'm, I'm sure it's the same, same for you, Heather. It, it definitely evolves as, as it goes along. You think you know the story going in, but as you uh, as you go along, you discover new sources, or you hear different voices, and and those uh, those come to the fore and change the direction of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about not knowing what the one character sounded like or felt like. There's a character in in uh, the the book less mentioned uh, on Lincoln, which is mm -hmm. Alan Pinkerton, and the yeah. and the story of how he got uh, Lincoln safely through Baltimore in 1861, but he was assisted by a female detective, this wonderful character named Kate Warren. And believe me, I wanted to know more and more and more about Kate Warren. Everybody wants to know more about Kate Warren. And I can't tell you how many people have come up to me afterwards and said, gee, I'd love to read a book about Kate Warren. So me too. I, mean, I would. I would have liked to have written one, <laughs> but everything I know is there, uh, and and there's only so far you can go in create in creating things. I hoped uh, that once the book was out and and uh, the story was out, somebody would say, "Gosh, you know what? There's a box in the attic. Uh, uh, there's a there's this dusty wooden uh, uh, tin dispatch box full of material, <laughs> uh, letters and journals and things. And maybe that would be of interest. It hasn't happened yet, but one lives in hope. Yeah. Or you could yeah. make it up. You could, but that would be fiction. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. There have been plenty of novels, and I imagine there will still, there will be uh, um, in the future. But the challenge for us is to, is, is to take what's known and make it the most interesting story that, that that can be told. And that's especially true, um, you know, in, in the 19th century, because what is there is usually it's there, you know, and, and there's, there, it's very unlikely that you're going to find that other uh, box, the missing box. It's possible, but it's unlikely. I feel sometimes I have the, the opposite challenge, which is I feel like I can never be done researching because surely I just haven't asked the right question yet. You know, I, I don't know anything about this one person, but but did I did I did I check and see whether he was a vet and there might be vet records? Did I did I did I check? Was he in a union? Did I did I did I check and see you know where he went to high school? Did I did I go find that yearbook? And so it's kind of this perpetual. There must be more to know. There must be more to know. Um, well, of course like, there is. Yeah, yeah there yeah. is always more to know. I mean, that's <laughs> the good part. Yeah, 
I think so, although it makes my books very, as my editor will say, it makes my books very long. <laughs> well, but you could also have the new revised edition with additional information uh, yeah. about the characters, so. Well, and then of course, when the book is out, then people crawl out of the woodwork, you know, and yep, then they right. say, oh, you know, I was there, and did you know this? And they'll send me new information, and yeah, that that is, that's, I, sometimes my husband is a 19th century uh, historian, and um, He's, he's coming out with this book on the New York kidnapping club in New York City. And he's just, he's trolling through all these records no one's ever said. And I said, but at least they're all deceased. <laughs> I'm very envious of the 19th century for that reason. They don't come at you and yell when, when, they, when you, they think you got it wrong or they think you, they disagree with your analysis of it, for sure. Right. They, and they don't file libel suits and things <laughs> like that. So, well, this is what motivated uh, um, Mark Twain, when he, I don't know if you read his autobiography, but you know, he, he insisted that they wait to publish it until 100 years had passed after he'd written it, because yeah. he wanted to be able to tell the truth about people and know that it was going to be such ancient history that nobody would ever come after him. He'd be long gone, yeah. and they'd be long gone. Uh, yeah. So that's and, and you tell truths that are very unpopular. I know that, I mean, especially in the, in the world that I write in, right, you know, if you're writing about civil rights and policing and, and race relations. And it's, it's, you know, someone's gonna be very unhappy and at the end of the day, no matter what you do. And so that's where the research I think, you know, becomes so important for me. And that's the, that's the part where I still feel very grateful for having that foot in the research world because I may not like where it takes me, uh, but, but it is what it is. Uh, I had a real controversy in the Attica book. You know, I mentioned I had named the shooters who had been protected by, you know, the state of New York for 40 years. And I had a lot of reporters, you know, question that, you know, should you have named them? Uh, you know, they hadn't been, they hadn't had their day in court yet, you know, and, and of course, in that part of the book, I don't call them murderers, I just simply note that the state of New York knew who they were, had X amount of evidence against them and chose not to not chose not to indict them. Um, and I had to think a lot about that, you know, what is our responsibility as writers, but I ultimately decided that you know, I, I found the information that part of the book was about the state investigation and what they knew and what they didn't know. And if I would not have told that story, I would have been making history myself. I mean, I, you know, I would have been contributing to the cover up in some way, right? And, but those ethical decisions too are always so fraught with what we do. Um, I also thought it was really interesting too because I had lots of damning things against prisoners in there. And as I noted to one reporter, no one ever once said to me, well, aren't you worried about, you know, so-and-so that, you know, what would his son think about reading that about his father? I said, no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> right. so, but, you know, but it's, it's very fraught, even while it's a pleasure to do it. So can we um, come up with some recommendations of, of other writers? Who, who's, whose writing do you admire? Dan, we'll start with you. Um, the, the, the writers oh. that write like you want to write, the kind of books oh, that gosh, you want you know, to so, emulate. So many, and, uh, and even as I begin uh, thinking of a list, I know I'm going to leave off a ton. I'll just mention the book I'm reading right now, which is Eric Larson's The Splendid and the Vile. And uh, it's just just tremendous. I mean, uh, it's a wonderful example of, of a writer finding his own angle on a, on a period, on a, on a story. And I, you know, I, I don't want it to be over, which is the, the highest uh, praise I can give. Well, that's not fair. Larson's had too much success already. He can't do it yeah, again. Darn it, yeah, darn it. Devil in the White City <laughs> is one of, I mean, one of my all-time favorite books. So, Heather, do you have any candidates of, of yeah. writers whose work you admire, or you'd like to write like them? Or I, I mean, I have to say that mostly what I read is mystery writers because I love to kind of, well, first of all, it's escape, escape for me. I don't want to read anything more. <laughs> If it's not true, it makes me kind of feel a little better. Uh, but but I also read it, I read mostly mysteries because I feel like they help me to think about creating, using words to, to, to evoke, uh, you know, the setting and, and the emotions and so forth. And so, um, and there's so many. I'm, I'm, right now I'm reading Juicy Adler Olson's mysteries. Um, 
on Denmark, which I love. And, and but I also, you know, Aaron Dottie Roy. I mean, there's just beautiful writers. There's great mystery writers. There's amazing scholars. Um, I just, for me right now, my fixation is on learning how to write better narratively. You can just read things and also you just feel like you can smell that 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 room and you can feel that fear or whatever. And for me, I want to be able to evoke that without the footnote that tells you that it was 20 degrees below zero. And 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 so that's what I'm mostly reading. And there's there's beautiful examples of that. Well, mystery fiction is a perfect um, um, sort of relative of history, yeah. historical writing because it's the same. You don't gotta you gotta have the clues. You gotta have the evidence in yeah. the book, or else yeah. it doesn't work. I think um, that's right. And and what's wrong with footnotes? <laughs> well, I always insist upon them, and my book has about two hundred pages in them. But the thing is, is they can't do the work of writing, and I think we do a disservice even in the academy when we teach students to write a dissertation or, or their first books. And I always tell my own graduate students now, you know, if you have this incredible, you know, insight and knowledge and wisdom, you know, share it. <laughs> and you can't share it if it's all locked in a footnote. I, I agree. I mean, my, my personal feelings about footnotes is that footnotes, there should be diversions. They're not quite the story. They're sort of something on the side. They're a little side room you can step into to visit briefly and then come back to the story. So, right. um, and hopefully they're a pleasant side room so, or an interesting side room. Yeah. Well, and they um, are other writers, you know, they might be, you know, to thinking about what you were mentioning, Dan, like, you know, there's certain characters that somebody else might want to go write about and, and, and just having like, whether it's a footnote or being able to talk to the author, it's sort of like, you know, tell me, you know, what is there? How did you create that character? How did you know what you knew about him or her? And so they're also great signposts for other people later. But I'm so interested in what you're saying about, uh, about reading mystery stories for pleasure and for escape, I consider myself uh, very, very lucky to still keep a toe in the mystery world. Uh -huh. But if there's one downside to it, it's that if I'm trying to, sh to shut it off at night, if I'm trying mm -hmm. to wind down, sometimes if I'll pick up a mystery novel, that sort of gets me going of, oh my God, that's good. How did he get that done? And it starts the gears going. Whereas sometimes if I'm if it's the last thing I'm going to read at night, I'm looking for something to relax and, and shut it down. And I do find I kind of have to curate that list through a different uh, uh, set of, uh, uh, through a different lens than, uh, than a book like, say, Eric Larson's or, or the many mystery writers that I, that I read and admire. Sometimes you're just looking for something that's going to, that's going to help you let it go. And yeah. uh, uh, thank for goodness me, for sitcoms. I mean, you know, <laughs> thank goodness for uh, for for PG Woodhouse. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. But you know, that kind of writing. The thing that I think I'm so intrigued about it is the is the way that um, well, actually, not just mystery writing, all fiction writing. The, the the ability to take really complicated ideas and and have tight dialogue and and, and convey complicated ideas in short snippets. Um, you know, I, I think that's a real, it's a gift, that's a craft. And I think on the other side of it, it's a gift to know that there's probably nothing out there that we fully understand and so research matters. Um, and I think nonfiction, is like, I'm so grateful for you to bring us together, Les, because I think that this is the one space where you can wed them. If, if, you're, if, you're doing, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're, if you're doing it well or striving to do it well, it really is a wedding of, new discoveries, that's the research part, new stories that no one ever knew that matter, but also to make them approachable, to make them digestible by everybody. They don't need, you know, they shouldn't have to work so hard <laughs> to learn. Uh, I, I, I think that, um, Dan, you're, you're underselling at P.G. Woodhouse because to me, what makes great fiction is that it is an accurate mirror of its time and place. Oh. And and 100%. so I mean yes of course Wodehouse is great fun to read and all that but what makes him a great writer is that I could add a few hundred footnotes to it and and help people see the things that he is yes reflecting about his world um, and and I always say and I would be the annotated you know Valley of the Dolls in which uh, uh, many things that we don't understand a hundred years from now will be pointed out. 
Not that it's great fiction, but it did do a good job of reflecting its time. Mm -hmm. um, and believe and me, I'd be the last person to undersell uh, P.G. Woodhouse, but he's, he's useful to me on my nightstand, and I have <laughs> dozens of things because I am never going to dip my toe into writing something like that. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing that's going to awaken uh, the monster. You know, the, the professional jealousies, the, yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the, oh my God, he's so good. Because that's just not an arena I'm ever going to climb into. And you I can, can just enjoy, enjoy it, it enjoy for the purity it. Yeah. of it. Yeah. I think that's right. See, I, I can't turn that stuff off though, Dan. I, I start to read that and I say, wow, there would be that's some really good footnotes ex ex there. Exactly. And, <laughs> and actually, now that you've mentioned it, Les, I hope, as soon as we're done here, you'll get to work on the uh, the annotated Jeeves because I'd love it. Uh, we one can hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you for this uh, stimulating conversation. <laughs> <laughs>